We can, and must, use our curiosity and intelligence to look to the stars. We must do it now before humanity is overtaken by some disaster that we can neither anticipate nor control. It's the height of the Cold War. The space race has already started. And the Soviet Union has launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik. Sputnik was launched on a rocket, and people understood that if the Soviet Union had the capability to launch things into space, that there was likelihood that they also had the capability to launch warheads. There's no doubt that Sputnik 1 scared the Americans to death, and they suddenly realized they had to pull their finger out and get on it. Russia had got the first object into space, they got the first animal into space, and they got the first person into space. And the Americans, with their technical superiority, or so they thought, felt on the back foot. Kennedy decides the way to beat the Soviets is to put a man on the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I was thrilled to be part of fulfilling President John F. Kennedy's dream of man on the moon by the end of the decade. However, the moon was so far away, so remote. Was this really going to happen? When Kennedy made that beautiful speech, we choose to go to the moon. R remember that it, it, from an engineering perspective, we did not know how to do that. President Kennedy set out the challenge to do it in the 60s, and uh, everybody devoted their total life to doing that. Realizing Kennedy's dream within the decade isn't easy. It takes a concerted national effort, unparalleled in peacetime. The scale of Project Apollo is hard to really even conceive of. At the peak, over 400,000 people were involved. The program cost, at the time, $25 billion, which was more than the Manhattan Project, more than the Panama Canal. I think it was George H.W. Bush who said that it was the best investment since Leonardo da Vinci had been given a sketchbook. Um, he was, uh, and, and he's right. NASA's space program needs more than money. It needs men willing to risk their lives piloting highly experimental spacecraft. In 1961, Alan Shepard becomes the first American in space. In 1962, John Glenn orbits the Earth. By the time projects Mercury and Gemini give way to Apollo in the mid-60s, America's astronauts are superstars. Most of us came from the military, where we'd been almost incognito, and all of a sudden you're celebrities. I thought these guys were the coolest guys walking the planet. You know, this is the time the Beatles were around. I thought they were cooler than the Beatles. I wouldn't call it a rock star quite, but uh, you could get a real swell head if you didn't watch out because you got a lot of attention. It's the morning of July 16th, 1969. Launch day. In a few hours, the astronauts will begin their four-day journey to the moon. And there was the Saturn lighted on the launch pad. And it is in the middle of this black ocean. Oh God, <laughs> what, a, what, a, what an excitement. It was a beautiful day, God, it was beautiful. It was just, everything was perfect. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. In the days before 24-hour news, all the networks clear their schedules to carry the launch live. T-minus 25 seconds. That rocket was big. <laughs> I mean, there's no way that rocket gets off the ground. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. There was a, just a, a huge, huge flash and a fantastic noise, almost like a bomb going off. Wow, shattering. 
Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Away from the crowds, Neil Armstrong's family watches the launch from a specially chartered boat. We were sort of off to the right. Um, and what this meant was that all the exhaust uh, came our way. And, you know, this, this buffeting of air against your chest is just, it's like nothing, you know, I've ever felt since. And you say, how is that standing straight up? I mean, it's barely moving. I mean, it's inching, and it's inching, and it's inching. Inside, three men risking their lives to fulfill the dream of centuries. When the rocket goes up, it's very stately, no deviation of path. Inside, it doesn't feel that way at all. The engines down below you are swiveling to keep it in balance, and so you're feeling little sideways jerks. And suddenly, I don't know, it, it, it overcomes gravity, and a swoosh. The Saturn V rocket blasts Apollo 11 out of Earth's atmosphere. Just 12 minutes later, they're in orbit, and our greatest adventure begins. July 16, 1969. Nearly a decade of innovation at breakneck speed comes together for one defining mission, Apollo 11. The dreams of millions and the work of thousands are now in the hands of three men, led by Neil Armstrong. As the crew say their farewells to ground staff at Kennedy, Houston stands by to take over mission control when the Saturn V clears the tower. You have a uh, feeling of intense relief. There's no more training, there's no more reworking these procedures. We're going to launch and we're going to go to the surface of the moon and we're going to bring that crew back. After three days of traveling almost five miles per second, the Earth is just a distant marble. The moon looms below, cold and gray. Armstrong and Aldrin enter the lunar module, separate from Collins in the command module, and approach the surface. Literally within seconds, we have communications problems, and that's the one thing we need in order to go down to the surface of the moon. Apollo 11, this is Houston, over. Armstrong spins the lunar module around to see if that enables them to hear the vital message they're waiting for, go for landing. We finally got a lock on through all the static, and this was crucial because this is the last time that the mission control is getting data on our orbit before we start making the maneuver powered descent. But then the lunar module starts guiding the crew to the wrong landing site. Armstrong takes manual control, seeking level ground. We didn't realize that he was about to land in a boulder field. Well, it turns out the computer is off by a little bit, a couple of a mile and a half, two miles, put us into a crater. With Armstrong flying farther than planned to avoid a calamitous landing, fuel levels start dipping dangerously low. He had to level off, fly across this boulder field, pitch up, slow down, and then start down on the final stages of descent. Well, that takes a lot of gas. And so we were getting very low on fuel. Uh, we had a, 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 a minimum for an abort. So I called uh, Eagle 60 seconds, and he would have an abort call. 60 seconds. Lights on. We're still 100 feet off the ground, and uh, we got a ways to go, and I'm getting a little nervous, but I, I'm not about to interrupt Neil. He saw the light, he heard the command, he's in control. And then I called Eagle 30 seconds, and now they were close, but not on the ground, so the tension was really extreme in mission control. It was, if I, as I recall, dead silence, and everybody was glued to their monitor. Fortunately, by the time 30 seconds came, we were about 10 feet 
off the ground, and I'm beginning to see a shadow. Uh, and uh, in a few more seconds, we're picking up the dust, and then the probe coming down from the landing gear touches the ground, and it sends a signal that says contact. So I call out contact light. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Six hours after landing, Armstrong steps into his place in history. Yeah, I'm gonna step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 20 minutes later, Aldrin makes his small step. 600 million people around the world watch the first humans walk on the moon, the largest global television audience in history. At the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, Skylab 4 Commander Gerald Carr visits the duplicate of the spacecraft he once called home. I'm remembering all of the meals we had around this uh, table in the wardroom. Uh, one of the things we always did on my mission was uh, we always ate together. With a freezer on board, Skylab's menu was as gourmet and luxurious as space food ever got. We had uh, three types of food. We had frozen food, and that was things like ice cream, uh, filet mignon, uh, lobster newberg, uh, roast pork and dressing. The second type of food was freeze-dried, and that's kind of what you get in a sporting goods store, a camping food. The third type of food we had was uh, canned food. NASA had a fancy term, they call it thermal stabilized, but it was just plain old canned food and uh, most of that was our fruits. Feeding astronauts on Mars is an entirely new challenge for NASA's food lab. When the missions were short, the crew members, really the importance of food was way at the, you know, way down the list as far as they were concerned. You know, they considered it a camping trip. It was, I can find something I like, no big deal. But then, early in station, we ran into some situations where food supplies ran low or coffee supplies ran low on orbit. And it became very obvious that this was a big deal for the crew members. We all enjoy our time around the galley table. I believe I hold the record for daily calorie intake. I was over 5,000 calories a day for the first several weeks I was up there. When you're exercising hard, you, you sort of want more food. But it cost $50,000 in fuel to lift the weight of a small bottle of water into space. And each astronaut would require more than 4,000 pounds of food over a three-year trip to Mars. That's a $320 million restaurant tab per person. So it won't be practical to carry all their nutrition with them. Instead, they'll have a high-tech interior kitchen garden for growing their own food. Once we're on the surface of Mars, we're going to be using what we call a bioregenerative food system. So this food system would include growing vegetables, fruits, and maybe other baseline crops. This is a crew coming out of their crew quarters. On January 16, 2003, the shuttle Columbia launched with a crew of seven on a two-week science mission. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Roger, roll, Columbia. Com Columbia now rolling on to the proper azimuth for a 39 degree inclination to orbit. Shuttle in a heads down, wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. During their mission, they chatted with their astronaut colleague and friend, Ken Bowersox, who was on the space station. We had a sort of a public teleconference with them where we got to talk over the radio with one of the shifts of the STS-107 crew. And it was really nice to be able to talk with them. The first time that I got to see the orbiter as the sun set, the whole payload day turns a beautiful 
rosy orange cake. It was funny, we were talking about what we were doing, the science we were doing, and then one of the crew members came up and said, hey, uh, enough of that, let's say, how are the families doing? <laughs> how are your kids? <laughs> a smooth and successful mission was coming to a close as Columbia approached Earth's atmosphere. This is amazing, it's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. <laughs> I don't know, I have to back my point. Columbia, Houston, com check. Columbia, Houston, UHF, com check. And flight ecom. Ecom. I've got four temperature sensors on the bottom line data that are off scale low. GC flight. Flight GC. Lock the doors. Copy. No phone calls, off site. Outside of this room, our discussions are on these loops, on the recorded Divas loops only. Minutes later, television was broadcasting this imagery to a stunned audience across the nation. For the first few hours, we were hoping that they'd be able to find someone that, that had survived. And then it became clear that that was less and less likely. NASA's biggest enemy is their record of success. They make it look so easy. Everyone that works on a space shuttle knows that every time a space shuttle makes it to orbit that a minor miracle has taken place. Investigators collected thousands of fragments of debris and slowly pieced together what happened. Insulation from Columbia's fuel tank broke off during launch and bounced off a wing, damaging the shuttle's all-important heat shield. Upon re-entry, the searing heat breached the shield and broke the shuttle apart. One of the lessons from Columbia was similar to the lesson on Challenger. Humans can make bad decisions. They can get comfortable with risk, maybe too comfortable with risk. All shuttles were grounded for two and a half years to overhaul the entire program. NASA knew that to succeed, a million things have to go right. Once again, they learned that to fail, only one thing has to go wrong. Of the six orbiters ever built, Discovery was the third. It came off the assembly line in 1983. It was remarkable for its engineering complexity and its sheer size. After the cramped quarters of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo capsules, the space shuttle was truly a giant leap. We started out in the space program with capsules, with little gumdrops. What were they thinking when they decided to build an airplane to go to space? They were thinking of launching more people into space more often, so humanity could learn how to live and work outside the grip of Earth's gravity. During its long career, Discovery took 251 astronauts into the vacuum of space, and she left an impression on each and every one of them. My first flight was on Discovery, and that was STS-92. I mean, it is an amazing thing to spend most of your life wanting to be an astronaut and actually getting to go in space. And it's just, it's so extraordinary to have your dream come true. Pilot Ken Reitler on the shuttle this morning. Discovery, that was the first shuttle that I saw, the orbiter that I saw. It was the first launch that I saw. So there was this kind of bond that started that, that continued on with uh, my assignment to fly on Discovery on STS-48 and then again on STS-60. You know, Discovery was my first uh, space shuttle. There's Carl Waltz, MS number three. And because it was my first shuttle flight, we did so many remarkable things on that flight. Always uh, be a special vehicle for me. Discovery left many fond memories in her wake. She also left quite a bit of history in orbit. Her manifest reads like a textbook of space firsts. I think the mission to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope may wind up being probably one of the most historic 
that, uh, that was ever launched. Mission Specialist Kathy Sullivan continues to prepare for deploy operations. Uh, this point, the Hubble uh, completely filled the payload bay of the orbiter with really just inches to spare to each side and a few feet fore and aft. You got to go for HST deploy ops. I think it's particularly appropriate the Hubble Space Telescope was launched on Discovery because the Hubble Space Telescope has been all about discovery. It has shown us aspects of this universe that are completely fascinating, magical, unknown. Four billion years ago, the surface of the young Earth was alive with volcanic activity. Organic molecules of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen mixed with traces of phosphorus, sulfur, and other minerals bled from the hot rocks. This inhospitable cocktail of chemistry is ready to transform the universe. But just how it happened remains a mystery. We understand life from biology looking down, and we understand life from chemistry looking up. But we haven't yet got those two ends to meet. There's still a gap in the middle called the origin of life. Cambridge, England. In the laboratories of the Medical Research Council, Dr. John Sutherland leads a team dedicated to closing that gap. Life must come from chemistry, it must be possible to produce life from chemistry, and we should be able to recreate that process in a laboratory. Scientists like Dr. Sutherland believe that the secret to the origin of life and its evolution lies with a certain fragile, flexible, self-replicating molecule called ribonucleic acid, or RNA. The large RNA molecule naturally self-assembles from much simpler molecular rungs, but for years, Sutherland's team has tried to determine how an ancient prebiotic chemical soup could naturally generate RNA rungs from even simpler molecules. But Sutherland believes that at the heart of the key reactions lies one molecule, hydrogen cyanide. The problem is that to form enough hydrogen cyanide requires a huge burst of energy equivalent to an endless lightning storm. This has long been thought unrealistic. Some scientists now believe vital chemical reactions on the surface may have been triggered by meteor strikes that were common events four billion years ago. New experiments have demonstrated that when the largest meteors vaporize on impact, the incredible temperatures generate a high-energy chemistry, creating huge quantities of a key reactive molecule, hydrogen cyanide. At the same time, the impact crater forms the perfect hydrothermal volcanic environment for organic chemistry. When John Sutherland's team in England recently simulated this chemical scenario, the ingredients spontaneously produced many key molecules they had been struggling to form. It looked like they might have hit upon the process that had generated the first RNA molecules. Late afternoon, Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. NASA is about to run a vital test of its J2X power pack, the engine which will allow us to maneuver outside Earth orbit. Can it fire for 500 seconds, the time needed for each burn in space? This is twice as long as it's ever been fired previously, and there's a danger the engine could explode. Today's test cost $350,000 for only 500 seconds. Expensive, but a small price to pay for the astronaut's safety in deep space. Idle sequence start, time is 15.04. One, two, three, four, 
The controlled explosion ignites, generating extreme temperature swings and clouds of hot gas. The rocket engine has a, you know, these super cold propellants that are several hundred degrees below zero. Coming in the top and a split second later, you got thousands of degrees of hot gas coming out the back end. At full throttle, the J2X will screen 290,000 pounds of thrust and burn an Olympic-sized swimming pool worth of fuel a second. Seven, eight, nine, 300. This muscular propulsion system shakes the Earth at 200 decibels. They can hear it 15 miles away. If you were to stand out at one of the viewing areas, your clothes would be vibrating. You'd feel it in your chest. We all wear earplugs for a very good reason. It's an awesome experience. 495, 6, 7, 8, 9. Engine runs on 499.97. The engine fires for 500 seconds at the very first attempt, and it's still in the test stand. All right, we have engine cut off. Crucially, this proves the J-2X can fire long enough and powerfully enough for astronauts to set a new course in space. Troy sponsors the Jetpack because he hopes it'll inspire innovation. His company also sponsors amateur rocket groups for the same reason. Today, he and Nick are heading out to Black Rock Desert in Nevada to watch a rocket launch. Amateur rocketry really took off during the space race of the 1950s and 60s. But as NASA's early attempts show, launching a rocket into space isn't easy. Since then, teams of amateurs have made numerous attempts to reach space, but these guys got there first. In 2004, we launched the first go-fast rocket that that uh, set a world record by being the first amateur rocket to reach space. It reached an altitude of 72 miles. Today, Jerry and his team will try to beat their own record. The rocket weighs 750 pounds, 412 pounds of which is solid rocket fuel. In just 12 seconds, it'll all be gone. It'll actually accelerate very quickly, 16 times uh, gravitational force, or 16 Gs, which a human could not survive. That speed of acceleration is key to getting the rocket into space. The GoFast rocket is real similar to what was used on the space shuttle. It's made out of solid fuel, and it has its own oxidizer and fuel built into it. And the jetpack that GoFast flies uses a, a liquid fuel, but has the same principle. Solid fuel rockets are much simpler than liquid fuel rockets. They consist of a steel casing filled with a solid fuel and an oxidizer that once ignited burns until it's out. So this back section all the way back is the solid rocket fuel and it's poured inside of this tube in kind of a liquid form and then it cures and becomes hard and there's a core down the middle of it and they pull that core out and that's what it burns and that's what will generate all of the thrust. It's a feat to be able to build a rocket like this with civilians. They're pushing the envelope on what rockets can do. And uh, they already have the world record, and they want to beat it just because, you know, they have the passion. Passion for innovation unites Nick and Jerry. That and a love of flight. But Jerry doesn't routinely strap himself to his rocket. Prior to liftoff, Nick gives the new Catalyst pack a spin. Nick's flight around the rocket takes 25 seconds, close to the max. And then the team preps for the main event. Three, two, one, mark. T minus 30 seconds. The vehicle is armed. The final countdown begins. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, Seven 6, six five, 5, 4, four three, 3, 2, 1. Fire. In a matter 
of seconds, the booster separates and the rocket is out of sight. And that thing was gone. They did it. The rocket beat their 2004 record. It went 73.1 miles above sea level and hit a new world speed record for amateur rockets at 3,780 miles per hour. An image of a black hole will provide a new way to test Einstein's most extreme theoretical predictions. Einstein's equations show us that if you spend an hour or two at the edge of a black hole and then come back to Earth, for instance, Earth might have aged 10,000 or a million or a billion years. So when we are observing the event horizon of a black hole, we are observing what really can be characterized as a time machine. Yet despite Einstein's equations, even he didn't think that black holes could exist. He didn't believe there was a way they could ever form. That's a sensible objection that Einstein had. I mean, after all, it'd be very, very, very hard to do to crush all the mass of something to a point. Einstein naturally and reasonably assumed that matter just wouldn't allow itself to be compacted that much. But evidence of a mechanism has been growing. Scientists now believe a black hole is the corpse of a giant star that's gone supernova. Deep inside the debris, the surviving core collapses to an infinitely small point. This is called the singularity. Its intense gravity warps space and time so severely that nothing can escape forming the black hole's event horizon. It's possible that black holes are ultimately a, a figment of the mathematical equations that Einstein gave us, but how better to begin to push this understanding than to look and see what's actually out there? And that's the promise of the Event Horizon Telescope. A picture will test one of the most treasured theories in science. Einstein's theory of general relativity. His theory says that mass curves the fabric of space and time, creating an effect that we call gravity. Einstein's theory of relativistic gravity, that is what lays the foundations that sets all of our understanding. Step one is just, did Einstein get it right? Is there some detail that's been overlooked? For a hundred years, Einstein's theory has passed every test, but nobody has ever seen its most extreme prediction. How wonderful would it be if the Event Horizon Telescope shows us that in extreme realms, Einstein is not completely right. It will be one of the most thrilling discoveries of our age, as we will then leapfrog forward in our grasp of how the universe works. A challenge to Einstein's theory and a new era of astronomy rests on the success of the Event Horizon Telescope team. After more than 10 years of planning, Yay! $50 million, and the combined brain power of over 200 international scientists. Attention, attention, doors and roof will be opening. Atento Guardia de Control, Apex Dos. Finally, the time comes to try and make an image of a black hole. And this has been a huge process, a very, very careful process. And the imaging team is now getting the first set of data they can use to make a photo of a black hole. It's really exciting. We just got the data. And that's, you know, what we've been waiting for for many years, so it's a pretty exciting time for us. This is the moment when we finally get to see what a black hole might look like. Each member of the team loads the data and starts running their algorithms. Are we going to, are we doing this? Uh, let's see it. Okay, okay ready, ready? set, set. Go. go, going, going, going. The algorithms are producing some tantalizing images. This is very early stages. This is exploratory surgery. 
patient is on the table, we've opened the patient up, we're looking inside, we're trying to find out what we see. Each member of the team needs to zero in on one consistent image. That is interesting. Whoa. <laughs> I'm getting something pretty similar, a little bit. And with the data for the black hole M87, one image soon becomes clear. I see a circle-y feature. <laughs> a bright ring of light circling the shadow of the black hole. What I'm seeing on the screen here is pretty startling. This is a case where the signal is so clear that it kind of hits you on the head with a hammer. This holds up. It's gonna be the discovery of my lifetime and I think of many other people's lifetime. And it's, uh, it's really sobering to see what a black hole looks like for the first time. We've now found a target planet that could be suitable for human colonization, Proxima b. But its distance from the Earth, 4.2 light years, is a staggering 25 trillion miles, far beyond anything we've reached with a spacecraft before. Getting to Proxima b is only part of the problem. Although we think it has similarities to Earth, it is very unlikely to be exactly the same as our current home. The crew may have to adapt to life in a very alien world. They will also need to find water, grow food, and use the planet's natural resources to build a successful new civilization. If the planet we are able to reach has no breathable atmosphere, they won't last long. Thankfully for our explorers, Engineers have been working on a solution. This is Biosphere 2. In 1991, eight people lived inside these glass domes in the heart of the Arizona desert for two years. The structure was built as what is known as a closed loop, completely sealed from the outside world. Everything the humans needed was provided by the plants. By photosynthesizing, the plants produced oxygen and removed carbon dioxide. They recycled water for drinking. And the edible plants provided food. Biosphere 2 is now used as a huge research facility for scientists who recreate and study the Earth's various ecosystems. In the miles of tunnels that sit underground beneath the greenhouses, Biosphere's director, Dr. Joaquin Ruiz, gives Danielle a behind-the-scenes tour. All these things that you see here to your right is all the air cooling and heating that's required to keep the place alive. And that's the, uh, that's the stainless steel that is underneath the whole biosphere so that there's no interactions between the soil and the biosphere itself. So the complete, the thing was sealed from the top and it was sealed from the bottom. And this is what it takes to cool the whole thing. But there's no way we could actually take all of this to Mars, though, is there? Well, you can't, but you have to take something similar. Because if you're going to be in another planet, you're going to have to deal with its atmosphere. You're going to have to deal with your growing plants. So yeah, something like this, or at least the concepts that are in here with different materials that aren't as heavy and so on, you would have to take. Professor Stephen Hawking and other scientists believe that to secure the future of the human species, we must colonize another planet. To stay risks annihilation. It could be an asteroid hitting the Earth. It could be a new virus, climate change, nuclear war, artificial intelligence gone rogue. We can and must use our curiosity and intelligence to look to the stars. We must do it now before humanity is overtaken by some disaster that we can neither anticipate nor control. 
For humans to survive, we need to find a planet that's rocky and about the same size and density as the Earth, so that its gravity will be similar to our own. Then, the crucial thing we need to sustain life is liquid water at the surface. That means we need to find a planet that orbits in the habitable zone of its star, the distance where the temperature is just perfect for liquid water. For our sun, a yellow dwarf star, the habitable zone stretches from around the orbit of Venus to the orbit of Mars. Earth sits neatly right in the middle. We now know that there is a planet around our stellar next door neighbor that could be suitable for colonization. Welcome to Proxima b. It's a little more massive than the Earth, and it's almost certainly a rocky planet. And there might just be liquid water at the surface. Proxima b might be our best destination for mankind's new home. But although it's our nearest planet, Proxima b is still a very long way away. Getting there, even with the fastest rockets we have today, would take thousands of years. Professor Hawking believes this will be one of our biggest hurdles. I have no doubt that we will eventually find ways of crossing the immense distances of space in just a few years. One of our species, great strengths, is embracing new ideas and evolving them into cutting-edge technologies. Just look at advances we've made in the fields of medicine, communications and electronics. We only built the first silicon chip 60 years ago. Now it powers just about every aspect of our lives. Our ingenuity will get us to Proxima B.